On to today's topic. Over the past year or so, influential, uh, respected voices within the foreign policy and national security uh, community have asserted that Al-Qaeda, and I'm quoting now, is defeated, is on the path to defeat, is on its heels, and has been decimated. Those assertions have been called into question any number of times. Uh, certainly Tom and Bill Rogier with the Long War Journal have, Eli has, but most vividly and most recently, uh, those assertions of Al-Qaeda's defeat and, and demise were called into question by the U.S. government's decision to close 22 diplomatic facilities in 17 different countries across North Africa and the Middle East and parts of Asia. Uh, Eli Lake and his colleague Josh Rogan shed a bit more light on this situation when they reported in the Daily Beast that the reason for the closure was intercepted communications among, than, among more than 20 Al-Qaeda operatives in far-flung locations. The report noted that, they, that this conversation, this communication, <coughs> was apparently led by Al-Qaeda's numero uno, Ayman al-Zawahiri, and also included on the uh, conversation, on the call, was Nasir al wuhaishi who heads Al-Qaeda in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, and was recently named Al-Qaeda's general manager. Tom Jocelyn and others at FTD's Long War Journal have followed these issues closely and independently confirmed uh, Eli's report. What does this tell us about the state of Al-Qaeda today, both its periphery and its core? Uh, I'm going to start by asking Eli to grapple with that question for just a few minutes, about five minutes, then we'll ask Tom, and then I'm going to take uh, moderate his prerogative and ask some questions, and then we'll go right to you and let you ask questions as well. So thank you again, Eli, for being here. Thank you, Tom. I note this session is on the record, and may I ask that if you have uh, phones and other things that go beep, that you turn them off or at least put them <coughs> on vibrate. Thank you, Eli. Great. Right. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me, and um, I should say that as we speak, there will be a new story from Josh and I on uh, the communication. And I can say now that give a little bit more details about what exactly happened here. Um, earlier this summer, uh, Yemeni authorities, with the help of U.S. intelligence, was able to uh, apprehend a carrier from Al Qaeda as he was uploading uh, minutes to what appeared to be a very important business meeting of Al Qaeda's Shura Council and its affiliates. When he was identified from that communications, uh, he, uh, U.S. basically discovered a kind of treasure trove, which was a recording of a seven-hour uh, remote internet conference. And this included video, voice, as well as chat. And it opened with a message from Ayman al-Zawahiri, which we report in uh, the story that is, I think, going online as we speak, um, that he basically said his assessment strategically is that the United States is in a similar position to the Soviet Union in 1989, and that it was important for jihadists to take advantage of this. And then he announced the big promotion for Nasser al wahishi who was the head of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and uh, the, the Yemen affiliate of al-Qaeda. And then from that seven hours, he, he then pretty much disappears and comes back at various points. There is some debate in the intelligence community as to whether or not uh, Zawahiri, who did not answer direct <coughs> questions the way that Wuhayshi did, was participating directly or was he giving a video in real time to a carrier as he was monitoring it remotely. Um, certainly, most of what we understand about the internet and communication security of Wuhayshi and Osama bin Laden is that they would not be online in this kind of direct communication. However, there, this is, I would say, a debate with the intelligence community. There are many who believe that they have this video of him addressing things. He shows up at various other points and at the end, suggesting that he was indeed in the conversation that we did not take these direct questions, I think is an important point. Um, I would also point out that uh, people have asked us, why would you report all these details? Well, our sources have, have made it clear that when the McClatchy and then later news outlets reported the communications between Waheshi and Zawahiri, it, 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 it was enough information for Al-Qaeda to sort of what they call walk back the cat and find things out. We left out some, of, some details from our initial report and we reported more of them. But at this point, I think it's, uh, we, we believe, especially since our sources were giving us this information, that it was an important story to help explain the current context of the, tech, of, of the threat. Now, on your broader point, which is, um, I think it's a tough one. I think that y you can't argue with the fact that U.S. Special Operations Forces in 2011 found Osama bin Laden and killed him. That was a huge blow to the organization. Um, but I would point out that 
in the years leading up to that, there were a lot of analysts who believed that bin Laden was out of touch, something of a figurehead, and didn't play a day-to-day -day role in an organization that had really devolved more to its affiliates. And what one of the stories I remember writing after that raid and others had written as well, that bin Laden played a, a pretty important role in terms of sort of <coughs> managing this organization that has all these various affiliates and aspiring affiliates. And I think we're sort of in the same situation now, whereas there are no doubt about it, Al Qaeda has lost a lot of senior leaders in Pakistan because of a very effective and lethal drone war. And uh, I mean, that's, that's not <coughs> However, they have adapted, and they, and as Zawahiri has shown, that he has the ability to manage and delegate. And in that respect, um, at least we shut down all these embassies, and, and the threat alert has been uh, significant. That I think that that shows that while there have been victories, Al Qaeda, at least the threat of Al Qaeda, is far from over at this point. Uh, let me go to you, Tom, and I'm sure I don't need to ask you questions, but mm -hmm. I do want you to elaborate a bit on this concept of the core and the periphery, because there was the, the, the idea that al-Qaeda was defeated, was dead, which we heard from, again, prominent voices, talk about who. And then there was a second theory that, okay, it's not dead, but the core is so diminished it can't operate. There is just the periphery, just these little satellite organizations that don't have a lot of cloud. That's called into question, too. It appears now that the core was, has been, despite the drone war, which has been, have been effective, the core has been able to remain fairly robust and fairly in control and, fa and fairly powerful in addition to the periphery. So if you would address that, and by the way, I perhaps address a little bit as well, just because I think we want to get this on the table, how it is that so many very smart people have been so wrong on these issues. Well, thanks, Cliff. If uh, you all leave here sick today, I am to blame. I am a little under the weather, so I apologize in advance. I'm a little nasally. It's the uh, uh, perils of having a three-year-old and one-year-old who attract every virus in the tri-state area of New York, so uh, apologize in advance. Um, <clears throat> well, the whole core and affiliates distinction, that whole uh, idea, is something we've been knocking down, really, for months before the embassy closures. I testified before Congress saying that this is not something that's been well-defined. The idea of what Al Qaeda's core is not even well defined. You don't even find uh, U.S. officials defining with any precision or saying exactly who's in the core, who isn't in the core. It sort of vaguely refers to the overall Al Qaeda leader and the advisory councils and advisory uh, sort of his lieutenants that are immediately around him in Pakistan and Afghanistan in that area. However, um, if you just start to think about it for a second, you realize that Al Qaeda is not so stupid as to keep all of their quote unquote core Al Qaeda members in one locale. They're not going to sit there and wait for us to drone them to death. They're going to disperse their assets, and they've been doing this for a long time. And the first example I provided as a counterpoint to the whole hardline distinction between core and affiliates was, in fact, Nasr al waheshi the head of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. <coughs> Lo and behold, he's appointed to the general manager position in Al-Qaeda, which is quite clearly a core function. Okay? Um, and he's not in Afghanistan and Pakistan. He's in Yemen, and he's the general manager of the organization. And, you know, so y when you look at that position and what it does, and Cliff, I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second, but, you know, that's a very important position with Al-Qaeda. He's somebody who has these very, you know, according to the few documents we've seen declassified and released from bin Laden's cash, has a very important role in managing Al-Qaeda's international operations. And he's doing that from Yemen. So, you know, Cliff asked me to, to try and talk about, you know, why people, so many people got it wrong. You know, I, I think that when you look back through the history of the post-9-11 world, um, across partisan lines, going back to the Bush administration, you can find assessments that consistently get it wrong in terms of understanding al-Qaeda. And I think a big, big reason for that is that we define it pretty uh, narrowly as sort of the terrorist threat against us or the West. That's principally what we're concerned about, even though that's not really their strategic objective. That's not their strategic goal. Attacking us or attacking the West is sort of a tactic in their broader game. When you look at their literature, you look at their leadership throughout time, they believe themselves, they define themselves as political revolutionaries. They want political power for themselves in the greater Middle East. That's their greater goal. And at times, it looks completely absurd when you look at the, the chessboard of what's going on. And other times, they have more success than we give them credit for. But that's principally what they're about. And that's principally what they're doing. And we'd argue that basically at this point in history, they've made some remarkable gains in that way. I mean, if you think about it on September 11th, 2001, you know, Al-Qaeda didn't have a small army in Syria. They do today, right? Um, they didn't have to force the French to intervene in Mali to kick them out from controlling two-thirds of the country. Well, earlier this year, they did, right? 
you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, they didn't have a thriving Islamic State of Iraq in the Levant, they do today. It's been able to double its operational tempo and is actually challenging, again, the Iraqi government and actually spreading its terror throughout the Levant. Um, you can go on and on and on like this. You can go to Yemen, where they, they challenge for territory, control parts of southern Yemen, have been pushed back, but are sort of coming back now. Or in Somalia, where they have an established affiliate, which they didn't have on 9-11. Um, so the bottom line is when you look at the broader picture and the political game that Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are playing, it is a cohesive international challenge. It's not something that can be sort of, we can play this disconnected dots with and say that this group here is not really Al-Qaeda and this group isn't really Al-Qaeda when they are clearly loyal to Al-Qaeda senior leaders and are clearly uh, advancing and are fighting for Al-Qaeda strategic goals. Um, so that's basically when, when you ask why it is that I think that so many analysts have gotten it wrong over time is because it's the focus is very narrowly on this idea that there are this group of super terrorists in Pakistan and Afghanistan who are playing these plots against us, and if they're not part of that, then they're not really furthering Al-Qaeda's objectives, which I think everything we've seen says that that's wrong. When you can start amassing the empirical evidence, you can see that most of Al-Qaeda's assets through the years has actually been devoted to other things. Let me throw a puzzle again of just a few questions. Well, I'll start with this, and I'll be, I'll be direct on this. I was recently on Wolf Blitzer's show with Peter Bergen. Peter is one of the people who has maintained and continues to maintain that Al-Qaeda, uh, he had said a year ago, is defeated. Now he would say is severely diminished. And in support of that argument, he would say, look, on 9-11, 3,000 Americans were killed. They have not done anything like that again. <coughs> they would like to do something like that again. They can't do anything like that again. Therefore, they are not the organization they once were. Therefore, my thesis remains correct. You want to just address that a little bit? Sure. Well, I think you, you, you're seeing, uh, uh, to his credit, I think you're seeing Peter's views evolve a little bit. His most recent column for CNN.com, he, he basically defined al-Qaeda the way I just did, which is that their principal strategic goal is actually fighting to establish Islamic states elsewhere. Um, in, if that's their principal strategic goal, and it is, then it's indisputable that they've actually made further gains today than they have at any time in their history. Um, the principal strategic goal is not attacking us. Now, yes, it's true because, I mean, if you think about it, think about the massive amount of effort that has been spent to try and disrupt their plots against us. The massive amount of controversial efforts across the board, not just in the United States with Homeland Security and everything else, but across the board through our European allies, across the world, the massive amount of pressure. It's taken all that to contain another 9-11 style attack, right? Um, and I would say, you know, what's interesting about 9-11, you think about it, and you think about their inability to carry out something like that again. Well, that's because we've raised our defenses sometimes clumsily, often clumsily, but sometimes very necessarily. But <clears throat> even 9-11, they had problems executing. When we were asleep, you know, uh, they had problems. Some of their operatives were detained or marked by the CIA beforehand. You know, they had ran all sorts of issues trying to execute 9-11. In other words, it's not an easy thing to carry out this style of mass casualty attack the way they want to do it. Um, so it, it, we risk, if we set the bar there and say that because they're not able to carry out another 9-11 style attack, they're done, I think that sort of ignores so much of the picture and the certain, sort of the evolving threat streams that are coming our way. Do you, do you want to answer that or should I give you a new question? Give me a new question. New question, okay. Uh, <laughs> this puzzles a lot of people. I think it does puzzle me as well. We have the events taking place right now in Egypt. You have Ayman al-Zawahiri's brother Mohammed had being arrested there. You have al-Qaeda also with what may be a small army in the Sinai. The, the estimates vary from a few hundred to a few thousand. Talk a little bit about at this point, if you would, um, because I think it is confusing, about the current state of the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and between al-Qaeda, between the various Muslim Brotherhood organizations uh, and the various al-Qaeda uh, groups. Okay. Well, in um, when, uh, when Gamal Abdel Nasser had Saeed Qutb hung, that was the end of the more radical, um, ascetic version of the Muslim Brotherhood in a lot of ways. Many of those people fled to Saudi Arabia, and the Muslim Brotherhood that emerged after, we call it post Qutb, uh, was one that was very much a accommodationist with the state. Um, Anwar Sadat made a series of reforms, allowed them to organize openly on universities, and the Muslim Brotherhood became a big part of the fabric of Egyptian civil society. Uh, when I lived in, in Egypt in 2005 and 2006, a big story was that a Muslim Brotherhood member was, uh, for the first time, the president of the American University in Cairo. You find Muslim Brotherhood members in charge of the Medical Association, the Association of Newspaper Journalists. So this really represents, I think, an important distinction in the philosophy. I think that Islamists, like the Muslim Brotherhood, believe <coughs> that 
over time, they could accomplish the goal of having an Islamic Republic by participating directly in politics and eschewing kind of terroristic violence. And for this, they were scorned by, uh, at first, Gemaa Islamiya and uh, the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, groups that were uh, responsible for the assassination of Sadat, and later by Ayman al-Zawahiri, who, of course, was a member of Egyptian Islamic Jihad himself. There's a famous exchange of someone named Dr. Fadl, who was in an Egyptian jail and eventually recanted a lot of his uh, support for uh, terrorism. Uh, and there is a famous line from Zawahiri responding to this thing, was the fax machine that you used is the mm. same current that was used to electrocute you when you were tortured. And so there is this long-standing uh, disagreement between uh, the Al-Qaeda side of the Islamists and the Muslim Brotherhood side of the Islamists. I think what we have to say, though, is that right now, uh, just looking at the events as they transpire, and I don't have any special insight into what happens next here. But one could argue, that if from the perspective of an Islamist, you won an election, you participated, you eschewed violence, you were disciplined all these years, and the military still removed you from power and still is making martyrs of your followers. So perhaps that could be a very you know, instructive lesson that you should have followed our path, which is that we are the more revolutionary path. And I think that the current events right now in Egypt with the uh, military coup uh, run the risk of driving Muslim Brotherhood back to where they were in the middle of the 20th century, which was an underground organization capable of terrorism and so forth, and uh, potentially uh, in some ways replenishing at least the ideological ranks of the more radical al-Qaeda side of that debate. Tom, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I mean, this is a this is like a whole other panel. I mean, the problem with this question is that the answer varies from country to country. Um, you know, in some cases you can find Muslim Brotherhood elements that are very accommodationist when it comes to the jihadis. In other cases, you can find them conflicting. You know, there's a whole backstory of the evolution of many of the senior Al Qaeda terrorists and where they come from. Their biographies, as I've detailed, a lot of them are rooted in the Brotherhood. It's a very complex, big topic. I think that you know, the bottom line is if you look at you mentioned Muhammad Al Zawahiri. Yeah. Uh, this is a very good example. This is a guy who criticizes the brother of Ayman al-Zawahiri, and he criticized the Brotherhood's elect electoral gains in Egypt on the premise that this was not consistent with sh his version of Sharia law. And so he was very harshly critical of the Brotherhood, and yet at other times he sort of has dialed back his rhetoric and has not wanted to side against the Brotherhood right. with the military. He participated in a political right. party that actually participated in elections, which is kind of a big deal to have. Sure. Al Qaeda salafists participating in elections, yeah. as we saw, which some well, people they, thought was a hopeful sign. Yeah, and they well, I, yeah, and I didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I saw it as the other basically are smart enough to, to, to play the tactical game, um, but that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's, it's dangerous to, to draw very broad conclusions. I think the, the the simple conclusion, and this is a point you've made certainly in your writing for a long time, is that the <coughs> the, the the alliances and the rivalries. Ha, ha, are, are much more fluid than we would than we would think. There's a lot less sentimentality in, in engaged in it because they are rivals. I do think that there is very bad blood between Sawahiri and the Muslim Brotherhood, and I know for uh -huh. when I lived there and I've talked to Muslim Brotherhood, there is a sense I think from the yeah. from the people like Gamas and the illegal Islamist parties that were not given the same privileges, mm -hmm. if you will, of Muslim Brotherhood. That the Muslim Brotherhood not only were sellouts, but they were collaborationists. Right. And if you read. Um, Saadi and Ibrahim's book, he talks about it. There were, you know, there were times cooperation between Egyptian authorities and Muslim Brotherhood against the more radical groups, especially when there were waves of sort of terror threats in the 90s and so forth. I'm going to ask one or two more questions, then I'm going to go to you. So what I want you to do is signal me if you want to ask a question. Somebody will come by with a microphone. I'll point to you, okay, so I, so I know you want to talk. Okay, I just want to play on Zawahiri yeah, real quick. On, on Zawahiri real quick. It, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, there's a whole history there with the Bitter Harvest, which is a book he wrote about, uh, you know, it had some very negative things to say about the Brotherhood. But it's interesting to track his rhetoric over time. Because um, one of the things he did last year was he released this video where he was basically saying that Al Qaeda can coexist with the Muslim Brotherhood, and he, according to my sources, was actually reading excerpts from one of Osama bin Laden's diaries about how there was this disagreement over how to conduct a jihad in Afghanistan between the Brotherhood, which was sponsoring its own uh, folks in that region, and that bin Laden had his own disagreements with that. But over time, they sort of came to an accommodation on that. So he sort of tack back on his rhetoric against the Brotherhood, although he is critical uh, of their, you know, their participation in elections and that sort of thing at times. He has tacked back. But there's a, a bigger point in this, which I think is, is interesting, is how Osama bin Laden, there's one document that's been released that's very interesting, which is written a week before he was killed, which bin Laden talks about. He basically was reiterating the old KGB saying, the world is going our way. Because he saw a lot of hope in the Salafi trends in the bro within the Brotherhood that basically the people were tacking their way ac across the post Arab Spring world, and that's something I think has been discounted uh, uh, wrongly numerous times by American analysts. 
Uh, is it also fair to say that I think it was James Clapper who talked about the Muslim Brotherhood eschewing violence. Eschewing violence suggests that they find violence repugnant as opposed to tactically, maybe even strategically, they don't see it as useful at this particular moment. Would you agree that that has been a confusion in the intelligence community? The idea of because you are not participating in violence today yeah. means you have renounced violence on a, on a, as a basis of principle. Yeah, see that's where the story gets more complicated because it, it goes country by country. They renounced violence inside Egypt after getting their heads Seriously, kicked yeah. in. But um, they did not renounce violence through Hamas, which was a, a wing of the Brotherhood that, that, that spawned, you know, and took part in the suicide bombing campaign in the 1990s. Um, they did not renounce violence. Um, you look at the senior uh, sheikhs in the Brotherhood condemning violence in Iraq and elsewhere against American soldiers. You can go through a whole list. So, and you know, the, it, there are Brotherhood figures within Yemen, for example. There are big uh, um, supporters of Al Qaeda, including Sheikh Zandani, who's a Brotherhood figure. Um, Hassan Al Tarabi, who was a leader in Sudan as a Muslim brother, you know, he was a big supporter of Bin Laden. So, it, it's a very complicated story, well, actually. Anything uh, Yusuf Al Qaradawi says, I mean, he right. certainly doesn't renounce violence when it's against right. infidels. I mean, Al Qaradawi does. being the sheikh who is on Al Jazeera right. uh, Arabic, who uh, Muslim Brotherhood <coughs> spiritual leader, who just so everyone knows, Qaradawi right. does not renounce violence. Right. But that said, I think it's significant that you, you have to take into account the evolution of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in the latter part of the 20th century. It's an important distinction, considering that for most of the 20th century, uh, they were a major violent threat. Against. But speaking of, uh, let me just drill down on this a little bit. When we talk about Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood renouncing violence, what what we've just seen, it seems to me, is uh, the New York New York Times ran an op-ed from a Muslim Brotherhood member talking about the peaceful protesters. I'm sure there were some peaceful protesters. There were others who were carrying machine guns, automatic weapons, burning churches, and humil humiliating nuns. That doesn't strike <coughs> me as a definition of peaceful. Yeah, you know, it, I, I'm trying to unwind all those reports right now to figure out what yeah, I mean, I, the I, problem I, is. So much. Be there to yeah, there's, there's so much. Evaluate the claims. There's, there's so much. I mean, there's so much incentive to basically blame various groups at this point. It's tough to tell what what exactly is true, and what isn't really coming out of Egypt at this point. I mean, it's just a bloody mess. So. Okay. Um, another question, then again, just signally if you want to start asking your own questions. On the, uh, the conference call, for want of a better word, well, two things about the conference, the conference call. One, was it, uh, was it high tech? Was it, I mean, do we, yeah. is this something where you say, you know, uh, I'm an al Zawahiri here, he had his IT guy come in and said, explain to me how I, uh, what my handle is and how I do this. Was it really kind of I'm sophisticated? An I'm an al Zawahiri's IT guy is his son-in-law, a guy by the name of Magrebi, who, uh, that's his alias. And uh, he's in charge of a kind of technical committee in Al Qaeda that <coughs> is, you know, they have engineers. They have they have their own encryption software. They have uh, created a proprietary technology that allows them to have these kinds of uh, remote conferences that allow for video <coughs> voice and chatting. It's pretty amazing stuff, and it's advanced. They also have an intranet through other <laughs> sites. They have not only. Forums that we know about, like the Global Islamic uh, Media, what is the name of that? The GIMF, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Media um, Forum. Forum. But they also have other sites that are more <coughs> hidden in password protection <laughs> that allow people to kind of communicate with, uh, you know, the mothership, if you will, in certain respects. It's dicey stuff. They still use carrier, uh, carriers. Uh, they're constantly aware of uh, internet security. Uh, they, no one is allowed to, at any level, to, to use any kind of wireless broadcasting. I mean, they, they know a lot about American intelligence capabilities as well, and it is a constant kind of cat and mouse game. But it's, they, they, they know, they, they've developed some pretty impressive technology, what I've heard from my sources. Yeah, I would read. Eli, Eli uh, uh, mentioned he's got a new piece up just, yeah. just now, concurrent with this uh, panel. And I think that uh, if I'd go read that to understand a better situation, what the technology actually involves, how this evolved. I mean, sort of when, when Eli and Josh first reported this as a conference call, people were saying, well, it can't be a conference call because they're thinking in terms of normal American business conference calls. But that's not the way they do things. You know, we, we had heard the same thing very quickly that this was, you know, a very complicated high tech. I mean, I understand exactly why they were using that phrase because when you understand how they were interacting, it sort of mimics mix that at points. Um, but you know, you can look at other reporting and you can tell that basically the, the most the most important point about all this, to my mind, is that Ayman al-Zawahiri is in touch with not just one guy in Yemen, not just Nasr al who is now general manager of al-Qaeda, but you know, a couple dozen or so senior al-Qaeda operatives and lieutenants around the globe through this whole forum. And that is not somebody who is uh, disassociated from the global al-Qaeda network, that's somebody who's very much involved. So in, in utilizing go to sure com or whatever yeah. it was here. Um, were there any groups on there that kind of surprised you? Any groups on there that we that we uh, that we should be thinking about that we haven't been? 
there is a collection of jihadists in the Sinai that we've, I've written about and I know you've written about for a while that I think it's significant that they're not yet, I think, formally considered an affiliate. The fact that they participated was important. Um, mm. The one thing I'd say about that, though, is they have a whole process for who is formally an affiliate and who isn't. And you know, groups like Shabab withheld their formal allegiance until Lyman Zawahiri recognized them. You know, Shabab is in Somalia. Somalia, right? Uh, and those are front in Syria. We know, based on what they've said, actually pledged their allegiance and was accepted by Al Qaeda before the public sort of coming out party. So there's sort of this whole game that they play in terms of who they recognize for their own reasons publicly. Are there differences in, in I, mean, I think there are, but in sophistication among these groups from, uh, you take Boko Haram uh, in Nigeria, where they were on the call too, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, are, are there differences in sophistication? And are there disagreements that are voiced among these different groups in terms of where they should be and what they should be doing and uh, strategically, tactically, otherwise? Well, the, the classic example of an affiliate disagreement with the core is, um, Zarqawi in Al Qaeda in Iraq. So when Abu Musab Zarqawi takes over Al Qaeda in Iraq, he leads an incredibly sadistic, almost pornographically violent campaign against civilians. And bin Laden and others recognize this. There is the famous communication, I believe it's with Atiya, the personal secretary of bin Laden, mm -hmm. where he is scolding him for continuing yep. on. And, you know, Zarqawi kind of appears, you know, as a loose cannon. And, uh, you know, so of course, any big organization is going to have these kinds of rivalries. So it, it doesn't mean that there's a unanimity there. Um, but I do think that it shows that there are kind of protocols, um, not just in terms of communications. I mean, there's a protocol for what, when you establish a new kind of branch, what, what committees that you have, and how you should look at uh, enforcing Islamic law and punishing people who violate it. And these are all these kinds of, th this is all stuff that's basically out there as sort of a model, if you will. Now, some people say that that's the franchise model, where you have, you know, basic instruction and then kind of go ahead and do it yourself. But there still is a bit of there still is a, it's a big organization and it's still managed by a leadership and shore council and I'm in Zawahiri right now. I'm happy to go to questions here if somebody wants to. If not, I'll, I'll continue to ask my own. Let's. There's a question in the back there. <coughs> just wait for the, if you would just uh, wait for the microphone and then just identify yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Joab Stein with the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And uh, we've touched, we went a little bit around it, but I'd like to hear a little bit more from you guys. Um, a little bit of uh, Dao Wali, um, his legacy. We're looking a little bit 10 years in advance, and we see a little bit of a shift back from, back from Abdal Azam, from uh, the Global Jihad Foundation. Obviously, shifted more when, when Osama bin Laden took uh, over in 9-11. And, uh, um, but are we seeing now, though both disciples came together and sort of shared the same ideology, uh, the Wahiri, are we seeing a shift towards a new approach to global jihad? Are we going to see more? You sorry, you spoke a little bit about ideology. Are we going to see more of a, a cyber security issue, cyber wars that is going to try and uh, develop in uh, Al Qaeda? Um, and how is it going to affect uh, U.S. policy? Thanks. You want to go? Yeah, I'll go. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen a market shift in how Al Qaeda operates in various countries. I think the big analytical mistake is to think that that's not part of their global designs or doesn't assist them in waging their global jihad. And let me give you a case in point, which is in Yemen, where the new Al Qaeda manager, the head of Al Qaeda Iran Peninsula, um, instituted a political platform under the brand Ansar al Sharia. And basically, this was their attempt to sort of rebrand themselves in the post Arab Spring world to say that we can provide governance and basic services to you, and that we can start basically, you know, adopting parts of sort of, you know, the Hezbollah or Hamas model where we're going to ingrain ourselves really in the community and sort of build up our own sort of governing model. In fact, the Associated Press recently came out with some letters from Waheshi to the head of Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb talking about all this. And his prime focus was how does he build an Islamic state in Yemen? What I want to say is that concurrently with that, as he's doing that, as he's, a, he's evolving politically, because they are political revolutionaries, as he's trying to figure out a new way forward for him and his organization inside Yemen, they are concurrent with that, launching plots against us. And in fact, Al Qaeda Iran Peninsula becomes one of the key, quote unquote, affiliates, which is leading the charge against the U.S. homeland. So they basically are able to walk and chew gum at the same time. It's sort of part of their overall model. And I would say if you look country by country, you can see even with the Nusra Front in Syria, you can see with Al Qaeda affiliated groups out in North Africa, you can see much more of this where they are trying to provide basic level services to people to sort of ingrain themselves within the community and provide themselves as sort of an alternative model to the existing government. 
I mean, I would just say that it was significant among the Qaeda experts and analysts in the U.S. government that I talked to at the time that you saw the participation of hardcore Salafist groups that were clearly uh, in, in sympathy with al-Qaeda's larger ideology participate in Egyptian politics. And as I, as I think I said earlier, I, th I think that their participation in Egyptian politics probably is coming to an end as, be as we, before our eyes, as we see the various arrests and crackdowns from the military, I would imagine that this could lead to a reassessment of that. I don't think, though, that Zawahiri in any way, at least according to this latest, this latest information that the U.S. government is receiving, is, 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 is going to dial back the terrorist or terrorism side of things. I think that it's, you know, as, as Tom said, walking and chewing gum at the same time. Right. Other questions here? As you think about it, let me go, I'll ask some more, but I think if you're on, if you would like to, we're happy to have you ask questions. We've been uh, a tough on the sort of uh, community, um, the national security community, in terms of the conventional wisdom being wrong. To give credit where it's credit is due, the 9 11 Commission actually was pretty good on many of these things and kind of foresaw a lot of what's happening. Do you want to? Describe that and give credit yeah. where it's due to Yeah, I mean, there, there were some really good passages, really pages in the 9-11 Commission where I think they, you know, we're, we're acting now today like the affiliates are sort of something that Al-Qaeda stumbled upon, okay? Like this just sort of, they just, just happened upon this. And certainly not all the affiliates were pre-planned in every detail. They weren't launched according to some, you know, macro plan that they, they got down to every little fine little micro level. Um, however, it has been a, a long part of their strategy, going back to the early 1990s and even the, the founding minutes of Al-Qaeda, to basically sow their seeds in all these other nations. And the Nylon Commission has a very good language about how bin Laden saw himself and Al-Qaeda in that role, and that the idea was that he was going to lead this Islamic army shura when they were based in Sudan, and they were going to bring in all these other groups that didn't need to control in every last detail, but they were basically going to spread Al-Qaeda's ideology platform and, yes, operational ties to all these groups across a huge array of countries. And it's amazing going back to the 1990s. I mean, you, I, I had the list in my, my congressional testimony re recently. The 9-11 Commission identified all these countries that they played this game in. And it's staggering. I mean, it's staggering from the North Africa all the way through into the Middle East. Um, so, you know, some of these groups, some of what we, just, we are describing as affiliates are part of a long-term plan that they've had for establishing their presence in these in these in these nations um, that's sort of had waxed and waned and this sort of had its ups and downs but it's something that they thought about for a long time and, and it goes to the heart of I think that the idea that the al-qaeda core there's some firm line between the al-qaeda core and all these affiliates I think that that's not true I, I would just stress also that in any big organization like al-qaeda there's never a monolithic view there sure. are elements of the US intelligence community that are very alarmed by the threat that understand core still has operational control. There are other elements that don't. Yep. And a lot of times, I would just say that it depends very much on, you know, what the White House at any given moment, you know, thinks of these very the yeah. competing analysis. But you rarely get anything that is reaching a kind of right. across-the-board consensus that's worth anything, which is sort of, yeah. you know, one of my personal things is I think national intelligence estimates are largely worthless. Yeah. Because the uh, it, boy, it sort of dumbs down everything to, to pretty <laughs> obvious you know, like common, yeah, like aphorisms right. that don't really tell us anything. Um, and the, I, you know, and, and, and in, the, in the world of intelligence anal analysis, there, you know, people will assign percentages to what they think is going to happen and so yeah. forth. And it's a pretty complicated thing, and there are usually pretty vigorous disagreements. Just, yeah, just two quick things. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing on that is absolutely right. I mean, I, the way I put it is that the, the Al Qaeda doesn't have a bunch of automatons. They are a human organization. You know, they have personalities, conflicts. Um, you know, there are all sorts of commanders who don't fall in line and do their own thing at times. But it still doesn't take away from what I think overall is a cohesive international challenge to us. And one of the, the points I make on that too is that. Al Qaeda is an organization that has um, been able to tolerate significant dissent, um, not just in Iraq, but also even on 9 11, where there are members of the management council of Al Qaeda who disagree with bin Laden's decision to launch the 9 11 attacks. That didn't force them out of Al Qaeda's ranks, they continue to be Al Qaeda. But that's the type of level of organization. Yeah, there, there is a large degree of coordination and cohesiveness to this whole threat, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily automatons who agree with every decision that comes down the pike. Right. Though let me just press a little bit. Of, it gets back to I think what Eli was saying is that at the end of the day, there is a, a narrative, often an oversimplified narrative, that's going to be embraced by the president, 
by his top uh, national security advisors, by members of Congress, and based on that understanding, that narrative of what we face or don't face, and yeah. how serious it is, and wh whether it's be it, it's motivated by uh, religion, whether it's motivated by ambition, whether it's motivated by grievances, on that basis, the policies in response will be formulated. Right. If the narrative is incorrect, if it misunderstands the situation, chances are the policies yeah. are going to be fl flawed as well. Yeah, I mean, well, but I, I would just. So far, what we've seen with Obama, I, I, this is a line I kind of came up with. I, I think that President Obama talks like a comparative religion professor and acts like a Blackwater executive in the sense that he has really pushed a lot of the war and expanded a lot of uh, the global war on terror, but he's done it, you know, through secret and classified operations. And, you know, and there's an extraordinary document. It's about uh, <coughs> a little bit under a year and a half, I guess maybe like a year and a quarter old. And it's, it's like a notification to Congress in open, yes, we are doing some counterterrorism activities in Yemen and Somalia and Pakistan, and then nothing else. But th these, are, these are complicated partnerships and really almost secret wars. They are conducted entirely at the highest classification level. So Obama has done a lot of that, uh, yet does not really talk about it and has chose, chosen to wage the war in secret. And I would just say this. The thing about doing these things in, in under so much secrecy is that just as you can expand it and not tell Congress and the American people, you can also take it away and not have much of a debate either. So you know, there's a lot of trust right now, I think, in the executive branch. And maybe there has to be. Uh, I'm not saying I know the answer here or what the balance should be. But um, the way that Obama, Obama's approached this is that he's actually done quite a bit uh, you know, in a lot of these places, including Somalia and, and, and all over, a lot of places, but he has not, he's made it appear that the war is sort of winding down, and he's taken credit for, of course, the incredible symbolism and important strategic victory of killing bin Laden. And the question is, will, will that then translate into ultimately winding down these secret operations that he's continued for much of his, for his presidency so far? Yeah, I think what you guys saying is true. However, I would say it a little differently, which is that he, he's doing this in a pure counterterrorism paradigm. What's happened is, you remember the big debate here, and what's the big debate policy-wise for fighting all this? It was sort of counterterrorism versus coin, right? Counterinsurgency versus counterterrorism. That was the big debate, right? What Obama has counter done- Counterterrorism versus counterinsurgency. Yeah. Right, right. And, and what happened was that, that Obama has sort of gone back and forth. He first said, well, we're going to get out of Iraq because we're going to invest more in coin in Afghanistan, but we're only going to do so for 18 months, and then we're going to pull out, and then, you know, who knows what's going to happen after that. And over time, what's happened is there's been this large buildup in, you know, where we're putting our chips in the counterterrorism bucket. The Problem, and this is not a political thing for me because I, I could point to where I think the mistakes were in the Bush administration in this regard too. Um, but the problem I have with that is if you look at the history of Iraq, for example, okay, you can see where this has failed, right? Okay, go back to 2010 and you go back to senior generals in Iraq, okay, who are saying we've decimated their leadership, we've wiped them out, right? Two thirds of their leaders are gone, they're killed or captured. You know, Al Qaeda in Iraq is on the ropes. What happens, right? A year later, U.S. forces pull out of Iraq. Right? What happens? Al Qaeda in Iraq spawns a larger affiliate in Syria, what first known as the Al Nusra Front, grows into the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, is now challenging for territory, controlling parts of northern Syria, has doubled its operational tempo from early 2012 to October of 2012 in terms of the number of attacks per week, and it's basically exploded in violence. Right? So <clears throat> by the pure counterterrorism model, you could say, hey, we got all these bad guys, we kill all these senior leaders, but what happened? Right? They were able to regenerate because we're constantly thinking in terms of just this top-down hierarchy and we're just going to knock off the top of it. That's my big fear in all this, is that we're now going back to a model, a pure model that doesn't work. Now, it gets incredibly complicated from there about how you actually do this. And this, then Eli's right. I don't know the answer in a lot of these countries what to do. And there are, you know, he's totally right. There are all these partnerships. And it's, it gets incredibly complicated. And I'm pretty much a solution policy agnostic when it comes to a lot of these countries, because I, you know, I don't claim to know everything. But my, my, no, my note of hesitation here on all this is we've seen sort of these tactics before, and they failed before. And that's why I'm, I'm worried. I mean, I don't know. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a clear opinion, I guess, on, on this, other than to yeah. say a counterinsurgency is incredibly expensive. Sure. It requires a lot yeah. of people on the ground. Yeah. It requires a lot of attention. Does the United States have the uh, will? Does it have the resources to do the kinds of counterinsurgency operations that Petraeus envisioned 
portrays executed for Iraq in these other places. Right. And I, at this point, politically, my sense is the answer is no. So I don't know that a counterinsurgency yeah. option is a real option at this point. Yeah, so I, 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 though, there's, there's two separate subjects here. I just want to that's right, yeah. Draw I mean, line. One is to right. say whether or not you understand what's going on in right. Iraq and you understand that Iraq is not a war that can be wound down, right. but rather you've defeated al-Qaeda there, but the grass is going to grow back. Right. You better be, you better remain there for some time if you want to establish, um, if, if you want to prevent a, uh, uh, the rebirth of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Sure. And, and, with, and once you decide, okay, we don't want al-Qaeda to reemerge re in Iraq, then the question is, what do you do about it? Does it need to be full-blown coin? Are there other ways to do it? Yeah. But the first thing is to understand yeah, exactly. there will be a threat there if we leave. Are we okay with that? Or do we think that there's a war in Iraq, a war in Afghanistan, and then there's these affiliates all over the place, overseas contingency operations, if you will, that we have to deal with? Again, that's why the narrative, the understanding of the situation is vital to the formulation of policy. Right. Yeah. I think it should be a vibrant debate about how to address all these things. I, like I said, I don't have all the answers, and there's, there's certainly there's, a, there's not a large appetite for large-scale coin operations. The thing I would say is, is you know, our enemy gets a say in this fight, you know, and they're defining how they, they want to move forward. And if we keep defining them narrowly as terrorists, we're going to keep picking off senior t commanders here and there. But I'm, I'm telling you, if you remember nothing else I say, okay, today, or any, or any point in my history here, okay, is that they're not just terrorists. They are political revolutionaries who want power for themselves, and most of their assets are put into acquiring that throughout the world. Can, okay? I, can I just, sure. on that one point, though, sure. their political ideology, <laughs> yeah. I think, is largely rejected by most people in the Muslim world. And the evidence of this I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm, a, I'm very skeptical of polls in the Middle yeah. East, by the way, just one of my yeah. things. I'm skeptical of a lot of polls, but anyway, but I'm, I'm not, I'm saying the evidence of this is that they have to have right. violent thugs enforcing sure. lunatic Sharia law in the areas that they've taken over. So if this was a popular idea, like I'd like to live yeah, in a world in which yeah. celery and carrots are segregated right. in the market to reflect, yeah. you know, what the Quran wishes, right. which is the kind of stuff that they were doing in, in Iraq, right. at least, um, then they wouldn't need to, you know, cut off the hands of smokers. Right. Yeah, but, you I, think I, mean? yeah, but I think that misstates it. And this is how. Is it? Right. Is it? Uh, part of the reason why I define it this way is because I do see that there's a large potential in these Muslim populations in each of these venues to turn against them, and they have. But here's the thing, right? So if it's such a, a, a automatic rejection, right, then why were they able to take over two thirds of Mali, forcing the French intervention? Because it's a right? weak state that doesn't have. Sure, a but they still did it, right? right? Okay, they control parts right. of Libya right now, right? right? I mean, they control northern Sinai, right? Right. You know, they control. They took over large ports of Yemen since 2009, right? I mean, right. you know, yeah. you know, they control large parts of Somalia. The UN report that came out in July says they still control large parts of central Somalia. So the point is that yes, they're 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 not the most popular brand in the whole Muslim world and there's this huge potential problem for them and there's a huge problem recurring for them that there's these large portions of population which reject them absolutely the problem is despite that they're still able to keep coming forward and that's the problem I don't think they can do it in a modern world I just don't think they're gonna be able to hold on there's well too many too many factors I mean, well the problem I do it yeah. in the remote area where nobody yeah knows. Well, it remains to be seen. I just, I don't, I don't like reduction. I don't think they can reduction sustain it. I don't think they can sustain it. I yeah. guess that's my point. Yeah. Let's go. Question back yeah. there, and then we'll go to Ariel up here. Hey, Got it. I'm Brian Katula, Center for American Progress. Hi, Brian. Right. Um, how do you see uh, Al Qaeda and its affiliates uh, and its position vis-a-vis -vis Iran over the last ten years? And you know, uh, quite obviously in Iraq and Syria, yeah. in opposition to it in Sudan, maybe something different. Yeah. And then. Uh, similarly, how do, how do you see Iran looking at this threat? Because we often discuss it from the U.S. perspective, as we should, but it's a very complicated game that's playing out in the Middle East, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of how their ideology and their actions yeah, have, have adapted. Yeah, that's a really good question, yeah. Brian. Everyone hear the question? It's really about how Iran is looking upon all this and the various, the, both the, the, the rivalry yeah. and the collaboration between Iran and yeah. Al-Qaeda. Yeah, I mean, so, so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, so, so a couple data points. Um, <coughs> Al-Qaeda leaders fled to Pakistan from Afghanistan after 9-11, and they also fled, some of them fled to Iran, including, you know, family members of both Zawahiri and bin Laden. Now, I believe that that arrangement was something like a medieval hostage, which is, you know, I, Iran, I don't think, you know, is going to collaborate at a kind of strategic level in the way that they collaborate with the Ba'athists in Syria. Uh, with Iran. But having that leverage that they did, I think it was an insurance policy against Al Qaeda turning against elements of their own population or provoking like the Baluch population or other Sunnis in Iran 
uh, in, in these kinds of uh, debates. And certainly in the 1990s, there were, you know, the Taliban murdered Iranian diplomats, and it was a, a, a pretty, pretty important, uh, pretty big deal. And, and Iran, I think, after 9-11, did cooperate at times, although they did other stuff too, with um, the U.S. in, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, after 9-11. Um, but that said, you know, I think that you can also see that, you know, they're like two rival cartels or two rival mafias, but they have an interest in, in, uh, in making sure that the FBI or, or, or the, you know, is weak in that sense. So it's possible that they can be competitors, which I think they certainly are. They certainly are theologically very different. Um, I mean, Al-Qaeda theologically considers Shiism to be, uh, you know, very much, uh, you know, a deviation of the true faith. But that said, I think that they have and they can cooperate when they see they have uh, an advantage in doing so. I think that they, there, there was some degrees of cooperation, for example, in Iraq. Uh, and so it's a kind of on again, off again. Yeah, I mean, this is another one of those questions that goes into, like, a, we could use a whole other panel to discuss. I, I think, um, you know, the bottom line is, I mean, right now, if you just look at it tactically right now, obviously Syria is a huge disagreement between the two. You know, this is a huge looming, you know, major problem, you know, even bigger wedge between the two. Um, and you see rhetoric coming out of Al-Qaeda's, uh, you know, senior leaders, you know, anti-Iranian rhetoric revolving Syria. The one thing I would say about this, which is really I've marveled at since the early 1990s looking at this one, go back and review the history, is how many times, however, Iran has managed to, and Al-Qaeda managed to put aside their differences to collude. And those differences do exist, and, you know, Al-Qaeda never wanted to be controlled by any state. They're a revolutionary force. They're not, you know, a proxy of Iran in the strictest sense. However, Iran has managed to work with them in a variety of ways through going back to the early 1990s. Um, and in that regard, I would say one of the interesting things that's come out of the Obama administration's Treasury Department, State Departments, are a series of designations and other public pronouncements about what the actual deal or agreement between Al Qaeda and Iran looks like today. Going back to July 20th, uh, 2011, the Treasury Department, you know, highlighted the secret deal between Iran and Al Qaeda. Then, in December 2011, they issued a $10 million reward for the head of that network for Al Qaeda's network in Iran. Then, in February 2012, the Treasury Department came out with a designation of the Ministry of, of uh, Intelligence and Security, Iran's MOIS, saying that they had been providing support to Al Qaeda. Then, in October 2012, another designation comes out of the Obama administration designating this collusion. And this, there is a network inside Iran of Al Qaeda, or Al Qaeda, today led by a guy one of the few al-Qaida operatives, Musin al-Fadli his name is, who actually had foreknowledge in 9-11. And they are actually facilitating operations throughout the Middle East. You know, it's sort of one of those things you puzzle at when you see the differences between them in so many ways, and yet this network still exists on Iranian soil. And I, I can't, I don't have time to get into it today, but there's a whole history here of collusion between the two despite their differences, which is really uh, a fascinating to, to explore. Ariel? Well, if you're going to take the microphone and introduce yourself, would you? Uh, if I may, two. Uh, one, to follow up on your Iranian uh, question. Um, if we see al Nusra uh, fighting Iranian proxies in Syria, at what point uh, we're going to witness a strategic, long term, mm -hmm. fully committed conflict between the Sunni extremists and the Iranian mm -hmm. state or uh, its satellites around the Middle East? Mm -hmm. The second question is a little bit out of area, and that's Sochi. The Sochi uh, Winter Olympics and uh, the statement by Doku Umarov, the head of the mm -hmm. uh, Kafkas Imarat, mm -hmm. uh, the Emirate of the Caucasus, that it's a fair target, and also recalling uh, his earlier commitment not to attack civilians uh, in the Russian territory. Um, Umarov uh, stated his uh, allegiance and support of Al Qaeda many times, his rhetoric, to the extent I read it, uh, is very much along uh, the lines of the Takfiri Salafi mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Islam. Um, to what extent do you see Al Qaeda um, uh, mobilizing its resources towards Sochi, and to what extent is 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 this a real threat according to what you see uh, reported? Thank you. Let me go. I don't know. 
<laughs> well, I'd say that they've targeted the Olympics before. Um, in fact, in La uh, I think it was in the London Olympics, actually, security services had to actually flag um, somebody who was trained in a Shabab camp who they thought may have been uh, planning some terrorist attacks in London or part of a, a cabal in that regard. I think you can, when you look at this international hydra, you, there's always potential for these big public events for them to come at it. How much of their operational resources have been devoted to it, I, have, I don't know. But it's always a, a potential there. And to your bigger question about the strategic differences between the two and where it'll be a break, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, I've tracked some of the rhetoric that's come out of Mohammed al Zawahiri, who's Ayman al Zawahiri's brother, and others who were there, you know, calling for attacks inside Shiite controlled states because of what's going on inside Syria. And so you see that upping of the rhetoric. And there are parties in Baluchistan and elsewhere, which to me look like they may be in the Al Qaeda sphere, who are sort of their chips for the anti Iranian card, if you know what I mean. Um, the thing I would say about this is, like, to go back to how the, these relationships evolve, it's absolutely fascinating to watch how, right, in 1998, Iran and the Taliban were on the verge of war, right, after the Taliban slaughtered these Shiite diplomats in Mazar Sharif. And yet, they came to a deal. They came to a deal before 9 11. This guy, Karola Kerko, who's down at Guantanamo, who's the governor of Herat province in Afghanistan, actually was dispatched by Mullah Omar to cut a deal with the Iranians to cooperate. You know, um, you know that type of thing happens. So these guys are willing to put put aside this deep animosity and hatred when it comes to where areas where they can collude. And the big problem I have is we don't know when it's going to tip. Sort of where they, you know, it could be that they have disagreements in one third of the board, but agreements in the other two thirds, and basically keep colluding. You never know. Other questions up here? Let me ask this one, um, and I'm not sure we, we know, but every one of these Al Qaeda affiliates uh, has to be funded. You can't run any kind of organization without funding. To what extent is Al Qaeda core uh, arranged for funding for uh, Al Shabaab, for uh, Boko Haram, for uh, for others? Or, yeah. My understanding is it's actually the reverse. It's a little bit like uh, you have to kick up the tribute if you're an affiliate, uh, uh, um, uh, sort of the way a local mafia crew would kick yeah, it up yeah. to the Godfather. And uh, you know that there, there are all any number of things that Al Qaeda has been implicated in, from including uh, you know very haram activity of drug trafficking, we know from Afghanistan. So they're you know they they are criminal organizations. So they have ways of making money, particularly when the state is weak. Yeah, I mean the, you know the Taliban doesn't sequester. You know. Right. <laughs> Right. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it, 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 exactly. I mean, it, 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 it changes from area to area how they operate. But yeah, there's, there's and some of the affiliates do a lot of criminal activity from kidnappings to, you know, drug dealing and that kind of thing, trafficking, cigarettes, you know. The guy, right, the guy yeah. yeah, Mukhtar, Mukhtar, yeah. Who, Mukhtar who, who launched the attack on, uh, in January on the Algerian gas slash oil facility, um, and who Eli did some great reporting on. Actually, he was the commander who was connected to Benghazi. Um, I think he was at the time Al Qaeda's Islamic Maghreb. He's a guy who's known as, you know, Mr. Marlboro for all of his cigarette smuggling. So you know, it varies from actor to actor. In, uh, I want to dig down a little bit more into Syria, where you do where the, the most important fighting force, we, we've said, is an al-Qaeda-affiliated force. But there are two al-Qaeda-affiliated forces, Jabhat al-Nusra and, of course, the, uh, is the al-Qaeda in the Iraq and the Levant. Yeah, it's the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Islamic, Islamic State of, uh, of Iraq and the Levant. Um, they are in a fairly vigorous competition. Um, talk about how that plays out. Well, you no, know, it, it, you're right. They are, they do, they do, there are leadership disagreements between the two the, that trickles down to the ranks. One of the interesting things, though, again, um, you know, is that I, our model of Al-Qaeda the Long War Journal is this sort of thing is not unheard of. These types of, you know, rivalries do occur throughout the whole history of the organization. Um, this was a pretty intense one, and it, it manifests its way, itself in ways I think are relatively new with the public rebuke of Ayman al-Zawahiri by the head of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Um, however, when you look operationally within inside Syria, there are differences, of course, but they still manage to fight on the same side against their common enemies, including the Kurds and others. So it's not something like where they've yet have turned the guns on each other. They're still keeping the guns pointed at their mutual enemies. And how does the Muslim Brotherhood relate to the Al Qaeda uh, forces in Syria? Uh, it's a total black box, as far as I'm concerned, at the operational level. I don't know. I mean, part of my big fear um, in the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood as an organization is that um, some of the leaders who returned to Syria as expats have been known to have ties to Al Qaeda. They basically evolved outside of Syria into Al Qaeda cells. I mean, if you look at the leadership of 
Al Qaeda's Hamburg cell for 9/11, or the leadership of Al Qaeda in Spain, all the leaders were once Syrian Muslim brothers, right? So, and, and I can get into that detail. Um, so I don't know. And I'm not saying all the Syrian Muslim brothers is that today inside of Syria. I, I just don't know what they are today inside Syria. And I believe they're actually what I've heard is that there are, there are some real divisions also within the Muslim sure. Brotherhood from the, the Aleppo group to the Damascus group. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. not sure I've got it all right. I, I, I don't have enough visibility to really comment on the internal jihadist right. uh, currents in Syria right now. So I'm going to just yeah. yeah. Let me ask. For, I'm going to ask if there are any final questions from any of you, and if not, I'm going to go there, and then I'll ask you to think about what we should have talked about, should have asked, happened that you want to conclude sure. on in your last few minutes here. Yeah. My name is Yamak Showers. I'm an intern at Human Rights <laughs> First a Law and Security Program. Uh, my question is about a uh, joint resolution which was passed in 2001, uh, September. The uh, AUMF. 18. AUMF. Yeah, right. the authorization for the use of military force. For the use of military force, yes. and that gave uh, the president uh, a broader uh, um, authority. authority to use force against any uh, nations, uh, individuals, and organizations who plan 9-11 attacks. Right. So uh, from then on, and for the past more than a decade, this uh, joint resolution is used as a legal basis uh, for using uh, force against uh, any terrorist uh, some even may not be involved in nine attacks. So do you think it's uh, now the time to repeal this uh, joint resolution? Well, um, I wrote a piece about this for Reason magazine a few years back. Um, you know, my view is that there is a risk that the war on terror could become permanent if you never revisit the question of what are the extraordinary powers we want the government to use to fight terrorism. I'm also of the view that it's a fairly long war, and uh, it's not like they've invented these threats or they, they like having global war and they're just warmongers or something like that. Um, I know that that's, that's, that's a little bit of, I don't, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I think it's a very good question. Um, the courts have ruled over the years that uh, the original AUMF would apply to affiliated Al Qaeda groups. I'm, don't hold me to this. I'm pretty sure that it was expanded in one of the recent defense authorization bills uh, that the president signed, I think, in 2011 or 2012, to include some of these groups that 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 the, that various uh, federal courts have have ruled because uh, you know would would be counted under that resolution. But you know, listen, there's a huge problem, especially I think you know, not to get too far off topic, but when you look at in my view, what I think has been problematic about some of the recent um, NSA disclosures that we're learning about is that, you know, if if you don't have members of Congress in the U.S. Uh, U.S. Pe American people knowing about what the government is doing and the kinds of extraordinary powers they want to to make the, the country safe, then you know you do risk this, the sense that this will just be the kind of permanent war that you know will never end and you you will never be able to kind of get grapple it, and that creates a, a kind of national security bureaucracy and stuff. But that said, the idea that you just want to, you know, that the, if, if, if you were to say that the, we should repeal that AUMF, um, then you would effectively be saying that you don't think that there is currently a war, and as Tom said, the enemy gets a vote, and I think that they're voting, they're still at war with us. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Let me just, before you maybe throw into the discussion, yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure that President Obama suggested, and I think it was before the closing of the diplomatic outpost, that the AMU, uh, the, the authorization for the use of military force, <laughs> kind of consider repealing it. But again, that or would modifying, get, yeah. or modifying yeah. it, it's very different, I guess. Um, <laughs> the idea of repealing it would be based on the narrative that the war is winding down, that Al Qaeda has been defeated. If we're agreeing that that narrative is incorrect, then we probably also agree that you need some kind of authorization for the U.S. to fight that war, unless the U.S. is going to say we're not fighting the war anymore, um, which in, uh, which amounts to surrender. No, I think I think that's right. I mean, I, th I think it's one of those things that, that, that can be and should be properly d debated, you know, uh, ongoing about you know what the scope of the w war is and, and what uh, authority we want to give the president and the executive branch for sure. I, I just say that the, the big one argument I've seen out there is this idea that the and, and unfortunately, I think the president's rhetoric in this regard is not helpful, which is the idea that Al Qaeda, the organization that attacked us on 9/11, is defeated or a shadow for its former self, and therefore, you know, there's a logical implication of that. Well, if the AUMF is based on the reaction of the parties that attacked us on 9/11, therefore, if that 
organization has been defeated or shadow itself, therefore we no longer need the AUMF. I think that's not consistent with the, the real threat environment. I mean, I think what you've seen over time in terms of how attacks have manifest themselves even just directly against us, you know, yes, they haven't been successful, but, you know, back in 2009, there was a serious plot against New York City subways that was launched by, you know, Al-Qaeda. That didn't involve any specific actor, actors involved in 9-11, but it was Al-Qaeda, you know, Najibul Azazi. You know, go back to May 2010, where the Pakistani Taliban, or December 2009, where Al-Qaeda in Peninsula tries to blow up a plane. And then May 2010, they try and detonate a bomb with the Pakistani Taliban, you know, in Times Square. And then go on and on like this. But the point is that the current threat stream you see is not something that's narrow defined to this, you know, few actors in Pakistan that we need to drone to death. You can see that it's manifesting itself in different ways. We're back there. Hi, Eric Naguena with a uh, graduate student with American University. Um, you guys have mentioned the success of the drone program in targeting al-Qaeda elements. Um, could you talk about, given the President's recent statements about the drone program, um, the prudence of continuing with signature strikes as opposed to targeted strikes when we know who we're going after. Go ahead. Um, you know, what we know about signature strikes is that they are imprecise, that you don't have it, you don't know that a person is going to be there, and that and usually when you're in war you never have the exact intelligence. Um, but uh, listen, there's something very disturbing about the U.S. <coughs> kind of, the idea that there would be a, per, a kind of for the, for the foreseeable future, the United States is going to have drones over these countries and we're going to occasionally do these sorts of things. I mean, we, that when that technology was really um, developed uh, in the last decade and the targeting was developed, the ability to really pinpoint, you know, in nanoseconds, uh, you know, various kinds of targets, it was, it was a, I think it really did turn the tide of war in Iraq, it turned the tide of war in a lot of, it was a, it was a very significant breakthrough. But we, I don't think we've had much of a conversation about what it means to do that. What if we're doing it for 20 years? And what does it mean if we do it for 20 years? And, and, and will eventually, are there other implications of, of having a kind of permanent, almost drone presence over a country like Pakistan that would make the United States, you know, maybe potentially radicalize others? I usually resist that kind of analysis because I think the radicalization process is pretty uh, detailed and an individual when they become a suicide bomber or a terrorist and it's not because they watched a television show or they saw news footage and then decided to become it. But it certainly creates an environment where we have, you know, po a political environment in Pakistan right now which hates the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and that's significant about whether or not they will allow their armed services to cooperate with the United States or whether elements of their armed services and intelligence services will really actually be on al-Qaeda's side because they have more sympathy with the Islamists. And uh, so I think that that is a significant concern. By the way, when, when I talk about that, I'm an al-Zawahiri, we do believe, is in Pakistan. Do you think there are elements of the intelligence and military bureaucracy that know where he is? Pakistan, so, never. So, <laughs> yet, yet another question that needs a, its own panel to answer. Yeah, but the only thing I would say is, um, uh, if, you, if you've seen, I think it was in June, I think the Obama, it was June or July, the Obama Commission uh, report was leaked. This was the, the official Pakistan right. investigating bin Laden's presence in Pakistan. I thought that report was fascinating because what they basically said was, and this is in Pakistan where, oh, by the way, you know, a, a journalist who was going to write for us at Long War Journal, two weeks before he was going to write for us was kidnapped and tortured to death for asking some of these very same questions, you know, and he was a, a shady character and a complicated guy, but he was somebody who we, you know, knew had ties to these types of, of folks, and, you know, uh, so it's a very dangerous environment to ask these questions inside Pakistan, yet this commission did. They did ask these questions, and basically what they said was, we can't answer them because we don't have the cooperation that we need to answer these questions. However, there's sort of this whole culture in Pakistan from the military intelligence establishment where all these jihadist groups that were either created or founded or sponsored by the Pakistani military intelligence establishment, on the one hand, also have ties and relationships to al-Qaeda on the other. And this milieu, if you will, inside Pakistan makes it very easy to sort of have these types of senior figures sort of, uh, you know, hiding in, in various different areas. So it, it becomes a large, complex topic about who knows what, but the bottom line is the environment is very permissive for that sort of thing. In the 1980s, the United States, and particularly the CIA, helped fund and build up yep. the, uh, inter, uh, the ISI, the Military Intelligence of Pakistan, in order to be a pipeline for the Mujahideen and other fighters against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, a lot of 
CIA veterans of that era still believe that guys who were in charge at the time, like Hamid Ghul and so forth, were good yeah. American allies. Yeah. Now it's been shown that many of those people have right. turned on us, or at least took Al Qaeda's side in the current situation, some more than 30 years later. Um, and so the U U.S. in the last decade began creating an element or a service yes. within the ISI called <coughs> Directorate T that was supposed to be the guys who were going to be really on our side. And then there were questions about whether they turned. Mm -hmm. So the, when you th – these things, you got to – these things have this kind of history. Yeah. And I just think that uh, it's almost inevitable that when you – do something in the name of counterterrorism, or in the name in the in the case of, of the Afghanistan war, an important you know part of defeating uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, there was, but there there was there were implications of that down the line, and that you know you the U.S. helped kind of create it was, and, and certainly Pakistan as well, and the military as well. So I don't want to. It's not all on the U.S., but um, you know these. I think in a lot of cases these organizations, you know, you don't buy anybody in this part of the world. You only rent them. Well, just the best example of that, just real quick, is Jalal and Akani and the Akani Network, who were thought yeah. to be loyal allies. And you know, there was a, a great recent book that came out, uh, you know, the Nexus of Global Jihad or something like that. I forget the exact title, but it's a really good book by uh, Don Rassler and Vahid Brown, which talks about the fact that the Akani Network, at the time when they were this conduit for American and other allied support against the Soviets were in fact very explicitly in their propaganda in the region uh, openly global jihadist and sort of basically endorsing the message that bin Laden would become so famous for carrying forward. Yes, over there. We've got to get a microphone to you right away. Thank you. Um, Joan O'Hara with House Homeland Security Committee. Um, I wanted to get some clarification on the question of the administration's narrative. Um, I'm hearing you say that, uh, and I understand that it's important that the narrative um, is accurate so that the policy that follows is also accurate and effective. Uh, but I'm also hearing you saying that uh, the narrative does not necessarily match what's going on in terms of conducting these sort of secret wars. Um, so the, the clarification I'm looking for is, do you think that we have two separate narratives, one for the general public that is, is leading us to believe that things are winding down and we've made significant progress, and then one for the administration itself with sort of the real story? Or do you think that um, – it just seems like there's a disconnect, and I was wondering if you could address that. Well, I think there is a disconnect. Um, but it's never – it's not exact. I mean, listen, they've, they've also moderated what they say publicly, too. I mean, they, <coughs> there was a period where they – really didn't acknowledge al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula as a serious threat. And then, you know, after um, Abdul Mutalab, they, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Christmas Day bomber, they realized it was a major problem, and, they, and, and you started to hear rhetoric, and then things were done kind of secretly. So it's not, a, it's not always necessarily a clean point, but I, I, I would say that, the, that generally they, they've claimed kind of political credit and as well as should, killing bin Laden is a major victory. So I don't, you know, I don't want to say that that's not as significant. But um, I think that they've, 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 they often say, and, and they say, they said it, you know, this month. You know, Jay Carney will say, you know, we think that Al Qaeda core is decimated, and it's it's this way of, uh, of sort of doing that. And as I said, I think that it's uh, it's easy to expand a secret war. It's also easy to, you know, kind of wind down a secret war. And it's much easier than if you had if, if you had more input from Congress and it was a more open and public debate. Yeah, I, I think my main concern is that the, that they may believe to a larger extent than we're giving credit for the sort of the public narrative, sort of the the Obama's National Defense University speech in May. Um, and the reason why I'm worried about that is because that's how you get caught flat-footed, right? Because you you start to believe that the things are really winding down or ending, and you don't really see. You, know, you, you after the fact, you respond to Al Qaeda in the Marine Peninsula after it becomes obvious they're a threat to the U.S. homeland. But beforehand, you should have been able. I argued beforehand they were a threat. You know, you should be able to see that beforehand. It's sort of that sort of tactical running around. You know. Um, <clears throat> And I think that's the, the, the main problem I have with that is that you basically stop communicating to the American people what this ideological challenge is, both for us and what the terror network really looks like and what they're really doing in sort of a way to build support to sort of do whatever we need to do in the long term to counter the threat. That's my main uh, fear in all this. I'll just make one point in that may, from a historical point of that, that perspective that may be useful, which was in 1943, Roosevelt and Churchill got together, and they could see at that point that they were going to defeat the German, Japanese, and Italian militaries. 
they made a decision very clearly, they talked about this, that they were not going to try to defeat, they had no intention to defeat or destroy the populations of Germany, Japan, and Italy. But what they decided that they needed to do was to destroy and defeat what they called the philosophies, which we would call the ideologies today, that had animated uh, the, 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 the uh, that, that, that were res was responsible for, world, for what we come to know as World War II. We have not, I think, when we talk about, I'm afraid when we talk about violent extremism and we don't grapple with the ideologies that have, uh, that, that are behind the regimes and the movements and the groups that are attacking the West, uh, I, we're, we're, we are not taking up that task, which is the discrediting, the delegitimizing of those ideologies. And by the way, we went and continued long after the war to delegitimize and discredit those ideologies. We remained, of course, in Germany, remained, of course, in, in Japan for a very long time. And, and, and some would say went too far in delegitimizing Nazism to the point where very few university students nowadays study fascist ideology to understand what could tell you what a fascist <coughs> ideology is, what its components are. They might know communism, but they probably wouldn't know fascism. And so by, by speaking of violent extremism as if it were irrational, rather than what I think it is, which is a, a, a very coherent ideology uh, that aims at, at conquest and subjugation of other peoples, we're missing an important component in, in, in any war effort. Would, would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I, I just say this. Here's, here's how I look at it. At one point, um, President Bush came out and said that we've killed or captured three quarters of al-Qaeda senior leaders. Um, and so the, the implication was, look at this. We really got them on their heels. They're almost done. A few years later, President Obama comes out and says, look at that, we've killed or captured about three or quarters of al-Qaeda senior leaders. And yet we're still sitting here talking about al-Qaeda and the threat. T to my mind, it's because it's misdefined. It's misdefined you know, in, 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 in for a lot of reasons, from you know, people returning to the battlefield that we let go to um, people who uh, you know, we never really properly defined what the, the organization looked like in the first place, and never really properly defined the scope of their ideology in the first place. There's a lot of reasons for that. And I think if you don't define it correctly, you can, we can have all sorts of disagreements about how to counter it, and I think that's healthy. But unless you're properly defining what it is it looks like, I think you're, you're leaving yourself flat-footed. There are no more, uh, yeah, there are, okay, there's a question back there. Let's go back there. Thank you. Um, I'm Cynthia Fairhot, <coughs> Associate Fellow at the Middle East Forum. Um, I, I had a question. Uh, shouldn't there be uh, some sort of uh, uh, an investigation or something similar uh, to uh, define uh, the accurate relationship, to accurately define the relationship between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda, especially that uh, I reported in Fox News uh, last week that uh, Egyptian security forces announced uh, the name of the assassin of Ambassador Chris Stevens, which was Mohsen al And uh, whether that is true or not, it is definitely worth an investigation. and. Uh, also the possibility of uh, a serious connection between the Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda, especially that Ayman al-Zawahri almost issued three videos in the past few weeks uh, that it, where he uh, almost inciting genocide against uh, Egyptian uh, military and police, and of course Christians and infidels, but at the same time he uh, announced his full support for the Muslim Brotherhood organization. And he also stated uh, that Osama bin Laden himself has been a member of the organization, and he only left because of logistic issues regarding uh, funding and diplomatic uh, embarrassment for the king if he's associated with bin Laden. So there are numerous uh, evidence. Also, we have evidence that uh, the blind sheikh, Omar Abdurrahman's dissertation, which he wrote in the 70s, uh, he stated uh, that he was actually writing the theological foundations for Al-Qaeda's organization. Until this day, he is considered the spiritual leader for the Brotherhood, and Mohammed Morsi tried to release him. So there is numerous evidence to a certain kind of relationship, and hopefully that we would be able to define it, because the possibility of um, Designating the, Muslim, designating the Muslim Brotherhood as an international terrorist organization should definitely, I think, in my opinion, be out there. Um, thank you. 
love to have your uh, opinions on some of that. Well, I mean, there, this is a again, it's a large topic, complicated topic. I don't. Um, when you talk about the blind sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman, he, he's not the spiritual guide or leader for the Muslim Brotherhood. He is for Gama Islamia. President Morsi expressed his hope during a speech that, uh, was during his inaugural speech, in fact, that, that the blind sheikh would be freed because that's sort of a popular sentiment that we've seen throughout Egypt and sort of disturbing in and of itself that that's popular. Um, but there, there, that's not to dismiss the issue entirely. I think you just have to be very careful about who, who's sort of evidence of this collusion and who isn't. Um, you know, a after 9-11, one of the first financiers of Al-Qaeda who was designated by the Bush administration was a very senior Muslim <laughs> Brotherhood figure um, who has since fought to be delisted by the UN and the US. Um, and, and there was actually a documentary by two new, uh, Newsweek journalists back in the day by uh, Michael Isikoff yeah, well, yeah. and, and about the whole Brotherhood and, and sort of the continuum between the Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda. It's, it's a very complex topic that, that sort of manifests itself in different ways. I mean, I'm all for investigating just about anything, so, you know, <laughs> so that's basically fine by me. Uh, but it, it's sort of a, a very large, complex topic in terms of who's good, strong evidence of that collusion and who isn't. I think there's a difference between mm -hmm. I mean, I, we'll, we may be seeing the blurring of it, as I said before. I think we've got to look at what's happening in Egypt right now. But I think at least historically, <coughs> recently, there's been a difference between Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood and what they do and what they think and versus the uh, al-Qaeda uh, approach and things. And I think that, you know, that we can talk about that distinction and also say that there are some commonalities at times between them in terms of political goals, but certainly not in terms of tactics. And also, I think... Not in terms of, I mean, I think that the Muslim Brotherhood in its own way has been more accommodating of modernity than all kinds of. Yeah, I mean, in one of his last letters he ever wrote, um, Osama bin Laden referred to the Muslim Brotherhood as a half solution. Um, and he was, uh, you know, pleased that basically he thought the new Islamist regimes of the uh, post-Arab Spring world would provide new opportunities for Al-Qaeda's sort of proselytization and sort of uh, going out and getting new recruits. Um, a half solution is not a zero solution, but it's not a full solution either. I think that's sort of sums up basically how they see things, that there are differences between them, but there is also commonality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jim, uh, systems, systems Analytics. <coughs> I think <coughs> trying to tie Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda together is not a requisite for recognizing Muslim Brotherhood as a threat. Uh, to really take a solid look at it, the Qatabis takeover of the organization manifested with Mohammed Badi's election as Supreme Guide, and evidence of that was clearly stated in his sermon on the anniversary of the batter, Battle of Badr a few months later. Certainly subtle in the way he presented it, but it was an unequivocal call to arms in my view. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm much more pessimistic, I think, about the Brotherhood than, than some folks in D.C. I think I, I, when I reviewed their rhetoric at the Supreme Guide level and the other leadership and sort of who they are and how these things work, I don't don't find them to be a, a, a peaceful organization that is totally set aside violence. I think that's a very tactical decision on their part within Egypt. And elsewhere, I could point to too many instances where they actually do support, either vocally or otherwise, violence. Um, that said, I mean, Eli's general point about the pol political distinction between them and what, how they operate in Egypt, we don't want to wash that away and say that they're, you know, we don't want to get into this reductionist narrative that they're all sort of Al-Qaeda when they're, they're clearly not. But to your point, that there is a independent um, sort of analysis to be done of the Brotherhood and sort of what its threat is and what it isn't, I think, is right. Well, you know, there, going back to, I think, it's 1991, um, when there were Algerian elections, there was a slogan, one, one man, one vote, one time, and the Algerian state with I guess tacit American blessing crushed what they believed was the potential for an Islamist kind of political takeover of their country. It led to an insurgency in that country through most of the 1990s that was very bloody. Um, it's it's a very you know I on Egypt I I'm not prepared to make judgments at this point because we really have to see how this a lot of it plays out. There's still a lot we don't entirely know, but I think it's very fair to say that. Um, there was an effort, clear effort, by Morsi to consolidate power, to, to, to put his people in important security ministries, uh, to basically kind of railroad any other, you know, to, 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 to push out any other dissent from the Constitution writing process, uh, to ignore his judges. I mean, there, there are a series of things that Morsi did before the coup that were disturbing and led at least led, I think, I, I think it, it was a, it's fair to say that there was a real danger that he would become the Muslim Mubarak. Um, and so I, 
in, in a certain sense, you can say Al Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood are not the same. There are important distinctions, but nonetheless, uh, Muslim Brotherhood ideology is maybe not compatible, as many of us hoped, including you know Tariq Ramadan and lots of people with um, the open society. And I'm not prepared to, to 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 judge to weigh in one way or the other. But I'm kind of leaning to the view that political Islam is not really compatible with the open society, even if. The proponents of that political Islam have, um, you know, renounced terrorism. I mean, in a way, can you? Is it? I think what everyone is, or both of you, all of you are saying here is, there's an analytical um, danger. One is that you conflate all Islamist groups as though they were monolithic, which they're not. The other is that you begin to make distinctions and you engage in the kind of wishful thinking that says, since they are distinct. There must be some that are mo that are not just pragmatic but moderate. If they're moderate, we can engage with them. If we only engage with them, we can have we, we can have a, a, a reasonable relationship with them. None of that is necessarily true. You can distinguish among these organizations, understand the differences, without believing that you necessarily have an opportunity for a constructive engagement and peaceful coexistence. Yeah, and I think you just need it needs to be it needs to be a very granular assessment of each of the different groups and how they operate. I mean, you know, in Tunisia right now, it's a very fascinating small nation where you have the Anada government, which is sort of the offshoot of the Brotherhood, um, and this sort of uh, standoff with an Al Qaeda-like organization on Social Sharia Tunisia, and uh, you know, there's a very interesting tension there. But at the same time, there's also some areas where they apparently have colluded, according to some press reports. Not really, not really clear. So you just have to every situation. I think you have to be very careful. But but the underlying guiding ideology of it, which goes to the bigger point, I think, is something that is uh, antithetical to our values, and that is worth stressing. Final questions? Anybody? If not, I'm going to ask the two of you just to hit any points that you think need to be made that happen or need to be stressed uh, as a result of the conversation, and, and conclude on that, on that note. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I guess I would say, you know, I. I it's, it's interesting. I sit here in 2013, August 2013, and I've heard so many different versions of the Al Qaeda is dead argument from the Arab Spring is going to kill Al Qaeda. Whoops, that didn't happen. You know, we've droned them to death. Whoops, that didn't happen. You know, I mean, you just hear all these different versions of the Al Qaeda is dead argument, and there's just there's something fundamentally wrong, isn't there? I mean, if you keep coming back and hearing this argument over time, there's something wrong with the argument. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense, and it it, it keeps propping up over and over again. And I think uh, part of it is that 9/11 exposed sort of a deep ignorance that we have as a society of this, not only this organization, but its ideology and everything that's related to it. And I don't think that that's necessarily been cured. I think that there's still a, a pretty large gap in our understanding of all this. And to the broader point, you know, Eli is, is right that, you know, there are many, many Muslims who reject sort of Al-Qaedaism and Bin Ladenism, and that it, it sort of has this, you know, big time flaw in that a lot of Muslims would reject sort of that rule, as has happened over and over again. The problem I have is that I don't believe in political determinism, right? I think that history moves on a razor's edge. The things, you know, sort of evolve in ways you don't necessarily expect. And this organization, its ideology, are revolutionaries. They're putting most of their assets around the globe today to fighting to acquire political power, just as they've done all along. And they're still very much in the game. And when you talk about a big picture strategy for the United States of America, it's true that not every Al Qaeda operative dispatched to these battlefields is immediately targeting us today. However, that doesn't mean there isn't a potential for them to target us tomorrow, because as we've seen over and over again, that's been been the case. I, I think one factor that maybe hasn't come up in this discussion is that the United States has gotten a lot better at counterterrorism, as the rest of the Western world has. True. Um, I don't have an answer to this. I, I like to avoid having uh, too many opinions as a journalist, but I guess I'd say. At what point, I mean, we, have, we are living in a political environment in this country where any major terrorist attack is unacceptable politically. And I think that we've seen with the policies of Obama that have continued a lot of things that Bush did, um, it's reflecting that kind of political reality. The question, I think, for us in this room and for us as American citizens is to say, you know, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of bleak to think that the United States will have to operate drones and have shady partnerships in places like Yemen. It's hard work. It's costly. It, it doesn't necessarily comport with how we ideal, how we'd like to idealize ourselves as a nation. Um, would we be willing to accept a certain inevitability, as I think Europeans in the 1970s accepted, that there will be terrorist attacks from time to time? 
and it's not the end of the world. This is what I think uh, Janet Napolitano, when she was Department of Homeland Security, uh, she was in charge of the Department of Homeland Security, talked about the idea of resilience. And I'm not saying that we should accept that as a reality, but it is something that I think is going to have to come up, because on the one hand, everybody agrees if you say, would you accept another terrible mass casualty terrorist attack? Of course not everybody wants to prevent that. But what if that means uh, you know, having lots of a powerful NSA and drone wars and secret operations and all these other things that we're beginning to see some people saying that they don't like either. And so uh, we haven't really been able to, I mean, I think that the side that wants to talk about scaling back the war on terrorism at this point should also talk about the idea that it's not a false choice, to quote uh, Obama from his uh, National Archives speech, between liberty and security. It's a very real choice. And uh, we should be coming to terms with that. Well, I think liberty versus security and the various trade-offs and how much terrorism uh, and damage you are, you're willing to <coughs> accept and inflict it on you would be a, a great other panel for us for, <laughs> us, to, for us to have. At least a fifth one. I don't want to argue one side of that. I'm just saying I think, no, no, I think we've had a little bit of a kind of, uh, I think sometimes our, we, we treat this conversation like we're children and we, we want to believe that we can have everything, you know, and we can't. And, uh, you know, I'd like democracy, no terrorism, <laughs> you know, a smaller government. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you want, but you have to, you have to look at it in the real context. You want to make a last comment? or? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I actually, you know, as a, somebody who's not a fan of big government, I share many of those yeah. worries. I mean, I, I you know, I, I'm asked constantly to comment on the NSA stuff, and, it, uh, you know, to my mind, I don't know enough about what exactly is going on to give you a firm answer one way or another. But I sort of have this guttural reaction where, no, I don't want my data scooped up, versus the analytical counterterrorism side of me realizes, but I want their t data scooped up, because I understand you're going to stop a, a terrorist attack. So it, it is, there, is a, there is something to be had there, a conversation to be had there. I just say that, you know, when, when you have that conversation, you shouldn't let it, and, and I don't think Eli's doing this, but some people, I think, are now defining the current threat environment and how things are evolving around the globe with the impetus to try to wrap all this up because they just want to declare it over and declare an end to it. And um, there's, so there's a danger that you go too far in, in your thinking on that and think that you're going to just say it's all over with because I don't want to deal with it anymore. And the bottom line is our enemy gets a vote. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, but there's still obviously a lot of ground we could cover. Let me ask you to thank our two panelists very much for this conversation. <laughs>